morning, everybody. Um, welcome to Sheep Street Baptist Church, and um, welcome especially uh, those who are visiting or here for the first time. Um, if you've got any questions, um, oh, Christopher, I think we still have music. Sorry, not that I mind the dramatic backing track, but <laughs> if you have any questions um, that you don't know who to ask, ask me, ask Pam, who's um, going to be leading communion a little bit later, more than happy um, to answer. If, you've got, if you want to pray with somebody, speak to us also, very happy to do that. Um, this morning we, we have with us Nay Dawson, um, who I'll tell you more about in a moment, to share something with us. Um, I don't know if any notices, though, first. Does anyone have? We will do birthdays in a sack. But it is, yeah. Do you want to say something about it, or because you're happy? To... Okay, so there. It... We have um, we have we have a group on a Friday night for um, kids in secondary uh, from year eleven through to year thirteen that we call Glow. Uh, we have a room that the kids have... Oh, year 7 to year 13, thank you. <laughs> that is what I'm getting to, yeah. So up there <laughs> is, the, um, is the room that the kids have designed and they've decorated. And um, it has different things in there like pool table and games console and sofas and stuff. And they hang out every other Friday and that's called Glow. What we're doing from this Friday is from year 10 upwards. Yeah, we're breaking that group in two. So if you're year 10 and above, then here at seven o'clock, uh, there are gonna be kind of games and fun stuff going on and also sitting and learning a little bit more about the Bible together. Um, so that is Friday night at seven. And then GLOW is still happening for years seven through nine. Yeah, and that is in the back room. And if your kids are primary school age, then um, the kids at this church of primary school age go to a group called, um, what is it called, Impact? Impact and Roller Coasters run by St. James's Church that happens in South Broome Infants, and you can look on St. James's <laughs> South Broome <Brim> Juniors. <laughs> and you... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Do, do shout out at any point to correct. Um, <laughs> South Broom Junior School, every other Friday, and that's great. And that is on St. James's Church website if you look in their family and church section. There is this event on Saturday, 2 p.m. till 7 p.m., over sort of near Westbury. Uh, fun games and activities for kids in secondary, things like more rambunctious stuff like axe throwing and wall climbing and less so stuff like crafts and things like this if you're more and sitting around chatting if you're into that sort of thing sorry there were no there were you just didn't do them so if you can look you can look on the website there or maybe we can leave it up at the end of the service if you you think your kids might want to go and you don't have a means of transport ask me and i will arrange that yes and have there been any birthdays this last week <laughs> has anyone had a birthday this week oh what a strange week all right well shall we uh, oh and there is a film night on saturday night and the leaflets are out here which will be on uh with the, showing the film the truman show from starting at 6, 6.30, 6 I think, through here, but come 6 for a 6.30 start. So shall we sing our first song? Yeah. Yes, yeah. let's do that. And feel free to stand if you like. i 
So um, this week, I hate to bring up this tragic news to people in this room, but some people in this room are going back to school this week. I'm sorry. Who's, raise your hand if you're going back to school this week. Oh. <laughs> Is anyone going back tomorrow, though? Tomorrow for the teachers. Oh, I'm sorry. What about kids? Any kids back tomorrow? Tuesday, or Wednesday, Thursday. Anybody got the whole week off who's a kid? <laughs> Not you guys. Maybe we could, um, I thought it'd be good to pray for the schools that um, our church uh, has 
people from. So we have Trinity. I'm going to name some schools, and in a second, I'm just going to leave it open for an open time of prayer. So anybody just pray aloud. Um, don't feel any pressure to do so. Just if you feel like it, do. But just so you hear the names to know the schools. So Trinity. Whitney's at Trinity. Melcham Oaks. You can whoop if you like, as if, <laughs> if you have any affiliation with them. Lavington. Lavington. Oh, you're not Lavington anymore. I'm going to see someone else. Which is? Uh, St. Lawrence. St. Lawrence, great. St. Lawrence. Any other schools represented here? Lawrence. South Broome Juniors. <laughs> Divisors. No, St. James Academy. South Green St. James Academy, St. Barnabas. Like Sorry? Daps. Daps? Oh, I went to Daps. <laughs> oh, great. Yes, yeah, so let's pray really hard for Daps. Bower Hill, Lavington, um, which I also went to. Um, it, Wonsdyke, some people go to Wonsdyke, Divisor School, Holy, Holy Trinity. Trinity. Yes. Sorry? Clarendon. Great. So we've got some names of schools. I'll just leave it open for whoever wants to, to pray for those schools, and for the, especially for the teachers, but also for the kids as well. <laughs> <laughs> Father, we thank you for the many schools that this church has connections with, Father, for the many kids in this um, town and the surrounding villages. Um, I pray, Father, um, just that the schools around here would be places of peace, places where there would be loving and kind and respectful relationships between students and pupils, Father. Um, I pray for those... Um, in leadership at schools and teaching at schools as they tackle things like bullying. Father, I pray that you give them wisdom and sensitivity and insight on that, Father. Uh, we pray for the pressures that teachers are feeling um, in the profession at the moment and other staff at schools, Father. I pray that you would give them, um, give them the resilience in that situation, Father. Give, um, give those in leadership um, wisdom as well to you. Um, to lead well and not to create pressure for those under them. Yeah. Father, uh, we pray for, um, pray for children going back to school, uh, ones who are worried about making new friends or reconnecting with friends. I pray especially for the kids in our church that that would be a joyful uh, experience returning to school this week, Father, and that there would be a joy in learning and a joy in the community that is in all those schools. In Jesus' name, amen. And Whitney was going to come and pray for us. <coughs> yes, before Whitney prays, primary age kids, we have a little group that meets out here, so um, follow me. <laughs> okay, we'll go ahead and pray then. <laughs> so if you'll join me just in prayer. So Father God, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here this morning and just for the gift of a new day. I thank you that your love doesn't ever run out, that your merciful love will never dry up, that they're created new every morning, that you are just so faithful, Father. Thank you. There's so many things to thank you for. Every person who is here today, the people of our town and communities, family, friends, both near and far. We thank you for them, Father. And thank you, too, just for the summer, for longer days, for slightly warmer temperatures, and just for the beauty that we see in the summer, for the, all the intricate flowers, the ripening fruit, and all the colors that come with growth, and also with the harvest. Thank you. Father, as the days pass, it's easy to get busy and distracted. So please forgive us for those times when we take our eyes off of you, when our responses to others are born out of impatience or selfishness, hurt or pride. Please forgive us. And please help us to love others with the love that comes from you. And in difficult situations, because we can all be tricky at times, please give us wisdom, Father, 
to respond to Turkey people or Turkey situations in ways that reflect you. And Father, I ask you to be active in our lives and in our world. We pray for the ongoing conflict in Ukraine and also in the Middle East. I think there were over 100 armed conflicts around the world today, um, which is just a heartbreaking figure. So I pray for resolution for all of these conflicts. And I just pray for those whose lives are impacted by these conflicts, who face food shortages or unsafe living conditions, for those who have been displaced, for those who suffer loss, for those who grieve and suffer, Father, may they know your nearness. May they know that you care deeply about them and that you understand their pain and their suffering. Please meet them in their pain and sorrow, Father. And may many who don't know you come to know you and your love for them. And also just pray for leaders in our community and our countries that you would give them wisdom, Father, as they make decisions and help them to create fair policies that show a value for mercy and justice. Father, we also give this coming week to you and ask that you be with all of us as we venture into it. We pray for teachers and all of the support staff at schools as they start back this week. Please give them energy and focus, and please help them build firm and loving relationships with the peoples in their care. We also pray for the children and students as they start back to classes. Please give them focus and energy in their lessons, a love of learning, kindness towards their peers. May new healthy friendships form and grow. And would you please be active in schools across the UK this academic year? And just thank you for the access to, ed to education that we have here. Father, just please be with us this week. Help us to keep our eyes on you, to follow hard after you, to know you more, and to reflect you to others as we go about our day-to-day -day activities. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Whitney. Should we sing again? Um, we rise to our feet to sing.
Jackson is going to um, do a Bible reading this morning, possibly from the lectern. So, Jackson. <laughs> Today's reading is from Acts 13, verses 1 to 12. Now, in the church at Antioch, there are prophets and teachers Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Zeusius of Cyrene, and Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Sod. While they were worshipping and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. So after they fasted and prayed, they placed their hand on them and sent them off. The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in Jewish synagogues, and John was with them as a helper. They travelled through the whole island till they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and a false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant of a proconsul, Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul, because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elimas the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elimas and said, you were a child of a devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You have all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You're going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. Immediately, mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. Jackson. So, um, Nay Dawson uh, is someone we've invited to speak with us this morning. Uh, if you want to come up, Nay. Um, I've known Nay for about 17 years. Uh, we worked for about five years together for the same organisation that works with university Christian unions. Um, although, actually, I've come to know Nay more latterly when we both went and worked for different organisations but found ourselves working together on different projects. Uh, across Europe. Nay now runs an organisation called um, Passion for Evangelism, um, which is a large part of their work is about training people, helping people learn how to communicate their faith to others, especially helping women do that in, as preachers and as public communicators, which in our church we believe very strongly in women in leadership and in women being gifted and called by God to preach and teach. So we're very thankful that Nay is part of, part of that work and she's written a book recently um, which is um, called She Needs that's about helping women overcome some of the barriers and obstacles to, to being able to exercise their gifts in the church and you can look that up online. Uh, what I especially appreciate about Nay though, very interesting though the things she does for her professional role are. I actually appreciate the way that Nay lives her life locally and in her neighbourhood and that's one of the reasons I thought it'd be helpful and interesting to have Nate share with us this morning because we've had people that like we had open door open doors was last week wasn't it and so you've got these dramatic stories of the persecuted church and we had um sat seven two weeks before that talking about you know the ways we reach uh, the Christians are using satellite television to reach into sometimes quite impenetrable majority Muslim context um Something I thought that Nay offered us was something, um, those things inspire us to pray and to give. Um, this maybe inspires us to think a little bit more about our context. We've got two parts. Nay's going to share something from the Bible passage that we just read. And then after that, Nay and I are going to have a little interview slash conversation. So, Nay, come on up. Shall I pray for you? Yeah. <laughs> Father, I thank you so much that May is here this morning. I thank you for the gifts that you have given her. Father, I thank you for her confident willingness to follow you, um, even when it's difficult. Father, um, I thank you for her love for people um, and her love for the people of her neighbourhood and around her in Southampton, Father, and pray that you would 
uh, just give her the words to say and give us the ears to hear in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's really good to be with you all this morning. Jackson, thanks so much for reading it. I loved the way towards the end of the passage you were just getting more and more excited because it's just a bit nuts, isn't it, at the end of that passage? And you could hear it in your voice, so thank you for explaining that so well to all of us. And that's one of the things I love about Acts. It's just not very ordinary, is it? <laughs> it's kind of out of the ordinary, and it's a bit messy. People get eaten by worms, and um, people get thrown out of cities, and crazy things happen. And I think what Luke's trying to say about today is that God's called all of us in our own life, wherever we are, However messy we are, however nuts the situation, God wants to work in and through us. And when I first saw this chapter, I chatted to Wes and Luke, I was like, oh no, how does chapter 13 go with everyday evangelism with your friends or your colleagues or your family? But actually, when I read it, I realised there's a really powerful message in here for us today. And I wonder, first of all, whether you've ever made some plans and they've gone wrong. You've made some plans and they've been thwarted. Anyone? I mean, th that is our life completely. So on, we were camping in France for two weeks, had an amazing time. We were supposed to come back on Monday, but we're having a bit of like, important building work done on our house. And the builders said on Sunday, you just can't come back. It's a complete building site. And when they say that, they mean it. They're really messy builders. So we were like, what, what do we do? We phoned the ferry company, they were fine. For £10, we could change our booking. We said to the campsite, can we say, yeah, that was fine. So our plans were back on track. We got a few extra days camping in France. It was lovely. Then when we turned up at the ferry port on the 29th of August, the woman at the desk looked a little shocked. And she said, oh, there's no cars with trailers booked onto this ferry. Can we have a look at your booking? John, my husband, had a look. And yes, it said the 28th of August, not the 29th. Our plans to get home were just so hard, they were thwarted over and over again. But we're here, it's fine, we're back. And the reason I tell that story is I think as we read this passage, we'll see that in the midst of human plans being thwarted, God makes straight paths. So if you feel in your life there's things that have gone wrong, Plans you made that haven't happened, major things that have been thwarted, God makes straight paths. And I can joke about France because it was fine, I got a few more days on a campsite, but there are some major things in my life in the last few years, really unexpected things. My plans for my life were thwarted. Things that were really, really tough that made me cry for weeks on end. My direction's been completely changed in my work, Tough things have happened in family and with friends, and yet God can make straight paths. So I want you to keep your passage open because it's such an amazing story. As Jackson showed us with his voice, it just gets more and more intense and crazy towards the end. But generally, Acts is a celebration of the heart of God. It's the story of how the early church understood the words of God from John 20, 21, it's how the love and mission of God is shown through his people. And so I hope today, as we, at the end, think about how God's love is shown through us, I hope we see that the whole of Acts is about how God's love for people is shown through his people. And I'm sure there'll be something in this passage very specific for you today. So Acts is a book that reminds us not to live in maintenance Christianity you know that Christianity where you're just a bit bored, can't really be bothered, a bit tired of it all? This is not about maintenance Christianity. If you remember back to chapter 11, I think you did that earlier in the summer, we see that God used a persecution of Stephen to push his people out of Judea. Can you remember that in chapter 11? Let me read to you verse 21. It said, the Lord's hand was with them. And a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. And then in chapter 12, God strikes down Herod, who was trying to oppose the faith being shared. And then in chapter 13 today, we see that God just fans this flame of the good news of Jesus as he sends Paul and John and Barnabas out of southern Turkey, out of Antioch and down to Cyprus into a completely pagan world where they just didn't know Jesus. 
And so we see God at work in amazing ways through his people. This is not the work of man. Have you ever thought about evangelism and just thought, I can't do it, I don't know the answers, I don't live a good enough life, I don't have any non-Christian friends. This is not the work of man when we read this story today, and that's what I want us to remember as we think about our own lives. God catapulted his people out of Jerusalem with a persecution. That's not the work of man, is it? God cut down Herod. God speaks in the midst of worship and sends out his team. And maybe that's what he'll do today for us. We've sung some really great songs, haven't we? And God wants to send us back out just into our ordinary lives, into our family, into our colleagues, into our hobbies and sports. So if you've got your Bible, let's just read again verses 1 to 3 from chapter 13. In the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simon called Niger, Lucius of Syrian, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod and Saul. While they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit set them apart for me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. So after that, they had fasted and prayed, and they placed hands on them and sent them out. Can you see that? God sets them apart. God calls them. And the same for you and me. God sends them. This is not the work of man. It's the work of God. So firstly, he sets them apart, and then he sends them. And when they arrive in Pathos, something happens that gives another fearful demonstration that God's heart will not be frustrated. Remember I asked whether you've made plans and they've been thwarted? God's heart in this story will not be frustrated. His mission will not be stopped. Have a look at um, chapter 13, 4 to 7. The two of them sent on their way by the Holy Spirit went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was their helper. They travelled through the whole islands until they came to Paphos. And there they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who is the attendant of the proconsul Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. So we're in Paphos now, in Cyprus. Anyone been there this summer or been there for holiday? I've never been, but they've gone from southern Turkey down into Cyprus, a pagan place. And what happens here, the governor of the whole of Cyprus, think about that for a moment, the governor of the whole of Cyprus, not just Devizes, not just Wiltshire, but the governor of the whole island wants to hear about God. He wants to hear the word of God. Can you see this is not man's work? Evangelism isn't man's work, it's God's work. God's at work in this man's life. And yet these missionaries are nobodies. They've got no human authority. They've got no political standing. They've got no big ecclesiastical church body behind them. They're unknowns. And so again today, if you feel like you're an unknown, if you feel like you're a bit of a nobody, Remember that this is God's work, because they are called by God and they're sent by God, and against all odds, God has given them a hearing. A pagan man, the ruler of the entire of Cyprus, wants to hear the word of God, and God calls nobodies from southern Turkey. So it's okay if you feel like a nobody. It's okay if you think, well, my friends and family, they're just not interested in Jesus. God's at work. But... Just as um, the word of God is about to be spoken, something gets in the way. The plan is thwarted. Can you see what happens here? We come across, in verse 6, a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was the attendant of the proconsul, and so he was close to him. His aim is to turn the proconsul away from faith, to defeat the purpose of God. Now just have a think a moment, those things that have thwarted you in life, not the camping trip, but I mean big stuff. Maybe when you were going to share something with your friend about Jesus, or you were going to go and do something for God in your local life, and the plan got thwarted. Maybe someone got sick, or something happened. His aim is to turn the broken soul from the faith to defeat the purpose of God. And I wonder if there are times when you feel like the purpose of God in your life is defeated. Has that ever happened to you? At the moment, I'm praying for a dear, dear friend who's got terminal cancer, and I just wonder, 
what's going on? You know, I thought she was going to be around for longer, we could talk more about Jesus, we could have fun together, we could swim together. Has the plan of God been thwarted? So like Herod in chapter 12, his aim is to turn the proconsul away from the faith. And if there are people in your life that are trying to thwart you sharing the good news of Jesus, or trying to say to you, stop being a Christian, it's just not worth it, just go and do something else, then you're not alone. You're right in the middle of this passage. And in verse 10, it becomes clear what Elymas is doing. He's trying to make crooked the straight paths of God. You can see here, he says, verse 10, you are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? So what are the straight paths and how are they made crooked? We'll have a look at verse 8 and verse 10. They're really similar words, to turn away and to make crooked. So the, you, the way you make it crooked is to get in the way of people coming to faith. So have God's plans been thwarted for this governor of the whole of Cyprus to hear the good news of Jesus? Well, let's keep on thinking. Firstly, God has made straight paths that lead to faith. And when everything else around us just seems to go belly up, um, we can trust him. God has made straight paths that lead to faith. God sees this proconsul Sergius, and he wants to seek and save him. This is God's work, not ours. So when we're really wanting our friends to know about Jesus or our family member to come to know him, let's remember that God is responsible for this. 275 miles away, God sees teachers and prophets. Remember the first bit of the chapter? He sees them, and they're seeking the mind of God. So the prophets and the teachers are seeking the mind of God, and he sees a straight path that leads to faith. He calls them. He sends them. He guides them. He arranges a meeting with the governor of the whole of Cyprus, and then, as we see, brings them to faith. So God has straight paths. He is still a pursuing God. And however much you want to run away from him, um, he is pursuing you. And he's sending us his church, like he sent his son, to simply share the good news and the love of Jesus with others. And then secondly, Elymas fails in making the straight paths crooked. So we can just rest a bit more and rest a bit assured in God's plan for our lives and what's happening because Elymas fails in making the straight paths crooked. He doesn't succeed in his attempt to make the paths crooked. Have a look at um, verses 11 and 12. Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You're going to be blind and for a time you'll be unable to see the light of the sun. Immediately mist and darkness came over him and he groped about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. And when the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed for he was amazed at the teaching of the Lord. So though Elymas wanted to get in the way of the proconsul hearing about Jesus, God intervened. And it may be that actually this passage brings up some really big questions about that, and I'm sure you could discuss with Wes and Luke or others in your home group um, this week. But God took the effort of Elymas to make crooked the path of God and hinder the faith, and he not only overcame it, he took it, and he laid it in the path in front of him. So can you see that? God was still working, even though Elymas was doing his very best to stop the proconsul hearing about Jesus. What does that mean for us? Well, again, if you've got friends or family that just don't want you to be a Christian or don't want you to share about Jesus or don't want to hear, then we can trust that God is still working. My dad isn't a Christian and hasn't been for a very long time. He hates Christianity and he hates a conversation about God. And whenever I see him, he does his very best to persuade me that Christianity isn't true. There's some new latest evidence that should make me believe otherwise. It's real for me and it's possibly real for you too. And finally, what does this mean for us? Well, firstly, that God is a searching and a saving God. So he is searching and saving you, and he's doing that with our friends too. He's not aloof, he's not passive, he's not indecisive. He's not in maintenance mode, casting or drifting along. God is a searching and a saving God, 
and he calls us to join him in that, to simply search and share the good news of Jesus with our friends. And then secondly, there will always be people and situations that make crooked hindrances, persecutions, but in that God makes persecution a launch pad for mission. We saw that in chapter 11 and 12 and 13. He takes Herod and he cuts him down. He makes Alamus blind. And at the end, the proconsul, the entire governor of the whole of Cyprus, says this. When the proconsul saw what happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. So I'd just love us to pause and look back at that passage. What is it that God's saying to you today? Do you need reminding that actually the Holy Spirit has set you apart? Do you need reminding that actually you are sent by the Spirit? Do you need reminding that although maybe there are people or things that are thwarting your plans in life, that actually God is in control? Maybe you need to trust that there are people in your life that want to hear the word of God. Let's turn and pray and ask for God to speak to us about how he wants to speak through us and in us, even in the messiness of life. Father God, we thank you so much for this incredible story. It just seems so outrageous and so unhuman in many ways we can see that you are at work in this story and we long to live like that deeply trusting you fasting and praying and in the midst of that having the mind of God Lord we want to be people where you work in and through us despite our worries and insecurities and hang-ups Father please would you Help us as we leave this building later to live for you, trusting you in our everyday life and trusting that there are people around us who want to hear the word of God. Please, Lord, would you work in and through us and help us have a settled trust in the role of evangelism in our life, the role of your spirit in calling us and sending us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening. I knew that Luke was going to ask me lots of questions, so I didn't do too much on giving examples of what I'm talking about, but hopefully Luke will ask now. Yeah, if you stay there, (laughs) I think I should have this mic on. Thank you for that, Nay, and that was very powerful. Um, I wonder if that that may, um, with the different things Nay said, there may stir up certain thoughts already for some of us. So I just wondered if it's worth just taking a minute just you want to think if you just want to pray for a moment and then I was going to ask Nay um, a couple of questions. Okay, so Nay... Thank you for what you shared there. Um, and I just speak into that. Speak into that. So um, you shared about God having set us apart and having called us, and you're sharing that with a passage that's in, as you briefly described, this quite concrete setting of someone's moved from Turkey to Cyprus, which are real specific local locations. So I guess it'd be interesting just to finish to have a little chat about, okay, concretely, how might this play out in our local context? So I want to just ask you a bit about your experience. Like, what is, what is your setting? What's your home life? What's your neighbourhood? What's, you know, tell me about life, not work life for you. Yeah, thanks, Luke. So I live in Southampton, been there for about 25 years now, married to John, He's a scientist and he grows bones. So if you need a hip or knee replacement, he's trying to grow, regrow bone within the body, um, which is brilliant. I've got two girls, Anya and Agnes, they're 12 and nine. And um, generally about me, so I love people. I love where we live. I really enjoy swimming, particularly in the river. That's my favorite thing in the world, swim most days with a river swimming group. And, um, 
I just enjoy getting involved with what's going on. In fact, if something's going on and I'm not involved, <laughs> I get a bit of FOMO for missing out. Um, so yeah, I think, is that enough about me? Yeah, that's great. And so in that specific context, so you live in Southampton, don't you, as well, and in sort of terraced house sort of territory there. What, um, when walking distance to your kids' school and stuff, what, what is it, how do you begin thinking then about just in your normal everyday life, how do you think about the ways that you engage those people around you? Yeah, so um, when Anya started, she's my eldest at school, it was really strange. In the school playground, it was like I was back there myself. People didn't talk to each other. Um, I was thinking, oh, I'm going to make some really great friends and nobody wanted to talk to me and I couldn't work out what on earth was going on. So when my youngest started, I was determined to make a difference. So that first week, I just said, right, who wants to come around for coffee? And I invited as many people as I just saw in the line, and I said, invite other people. And about 30 came round, which was amazing. And then, actually, the next week, someone else said, oh, why don't I have coffee at my house? And so it just spiralled like that. And still five years on, we're meeting every Friday for coffee. And that was really encouraging to me because it meant I could build friendships. When you do something that you love and you do it regularly enough and you do it with others, you make friends. And then into that I find people ask questions or I ask them questions and bit by bit as life happens, the good and the bad and usually the bad, you get to talk about Jesus in time. But I've been really committed to those women particularly and I do the same school run every single day and um, it's just about doing something regularly that you can make friends. Um, mm -hmm. It's not always something I want to do, um, but I do find you, you do make friends, and then in that it's, um, mm -hmm. it's a really great time to share about Jesus. Yeah, and I was struck at you, um, Nay and I met up, I don't know when it was, February or January, I was speaking at something in Southampton, and we met up and it was right bang mid-afternoon mid so you said let's go for a walk and I need to check in on my kid we did, we, the school run was incorporated on the return leg of, the, of, of our walk and it was brilliant actually just seeing you chatting to people knowing about people, knowing about different people's lives there on the school playground. Now as someone who would you know, happily sit on their own with a book <laughs> like how, how is it, because there's something isn't there, slightly intimidating about like I can see that and I'm like, Nay, that's great that you do that. And I went back and said to Whitney, it's so great that Nay just connects with people on the school ground. How do we, whether it's school ground or the other context where we find ourselves brushing up against people, same people regularly, but we don't like, we don't have that, nap. it's going to be on us if we're going to have a connection. Like, what, what would you suggest would be helpful ways that we could yeah. do that? I mean, I think, firstly, I really love telling people about Jesus. And I think, because I've come from a family that don't know Jesus, my brothers still don't, my dad doesn't. And I feel really convinced that God makes all the difference in my life. And he could in theirs too. And so I want to tell them about him. But in order to tell people I need to be their friend, I can't just shout it at them or slap it on them or vomit it all over them, can I? I've got to be their friends. And so, therefore, friendship's really important. And this whole kind of God sending out and searching for people is that they know him and they're in relationship with him. So it's modeled from God himself. So I think um, for me, friendship's really, really important, more important than me being a bit nervous or a bit scared or a bit afraid. That's higher than any of those things. So yes, I am nervous, afraid, scared. Tonight I've been invited to, what is it? Uh, Pims and pudding at eight. <laughs> and I don't want to go because I've recently been diagnosed with diabetes and you can't have puddings and pims, can you? But I do want to go because I want to see them. But also I am a bit nervous, like, seeing people after six weeks away. And in that, I think, well, actually, no, you'll have a great time. People will be really friendly. You'll love it. You'll come home late. It'll be great. Don't worry about it. So I'm not saying I'm, like, perfect in this. It doesn't always come naturally. But I think as Christians, we get so focused on religious stuff like church or reading the Bible, praying, we forget that actually God wants us to live for him in all areas of our life, that everything we do is worship, whether that's um, how I swim in the river, how I chat to people, every single thing I do is worship. And if that's true, then in that I can invest in those things heavily. I can spend a lot of time river swimming. I can spend, well, my husband can spend time getting to know his colleagues. That's as spiritual as being here and I think when we realize that actually we can get more involved in these things and we get to chat to people more 
And I just think because I've seen God work powerfully in friendships, it's not just friendships, is it? People will come off the street, maybe you're here today for the first time. People come into church, won't they, on their own? People will read the Bible on their own. It's not just friendships, but God invites us to be part of that. So I think it's really important, um, whatever part of the spectrum you're on, from introvert to extrovert, really. Yeah, that's great. And something um, I think that's kind of striking me there, and there's a lot of things that possibly struck other people, but one thing that strikes me there is you're saying, I'm very passionate about sharing Jesus with people. And then you hit that intimidating question of, like, what do I say to people? But actually you say, no, what I do is I... um, I just make friends, yeah. and I just connect with people. Yeah. And do you, do you just see how God works then, or what? Yeah, I, I think, remember what I tried to say in that passage, this is God's work, this isn't man's work or woman's work. <laughs> so just make friends and pray lots and lots and lots. And you'll be amazed at that. When you genuinely make friends and you commit to these people and pray for them, God's at work. So, for example, sorry to write River Swimming again, but I do love it. Um, there's a new guy that joined... Um, I'll call him a different name in case he's listening. Um, and he's called Simon, not really, but um, <laughs> where, like, we swam together for about four months or so. And then he, he texted me one day to say, Nay, I know we don't talk about religious stuff in the water, but I just wondering what you think about the use of lyric, Christian lyrics in heavy metal music. <laughs> I was like, all oh, right, <laughs> like, okay, I don't know what I think. Um, let's chat about it, which we did. And then the next week or the next day, he was like, nay, so right, Adam and Eve, how come they had belly buttons if they were the first people ever on the planet? And then the next day it was about dinosaurs. And then interestingly, my other friend who's a Christian was swimming and she was like, right, enough of these questions for us. I've got a question for you. Why are you an atheist? Why don't you believe in God? So then the conversation started. This is all in the last few weeks and months. And then my friend went to New Wine, a Christian festival. And we're called the Kingfisher Swimmers because a kingfisher goes up and down every day. And at New Wine, she saw these easy-to-read Bibles with a kingfisher on the front. And she was like, that is for us as a group. So she bought loads, like 10 of them. And then she gave one to this friend, Simon. And... Um, he wrote to me and said, I think if I read it, I'm going to turn into a pillar of salt. I was like, oh, I think you're remembering a bit from the Bible where someone's turned into a pillar of salt. So I said, look, it sounds like you know the Bible a little. Maybe you should get to know it more. Why don't you read it? That's where we're up to today. Last time we swam two days ago, he didn't want to talk too much. Um, but I, I genuinely think if you genuinely love people as life happens, again, in this river swimming group, um, some really awful things have happened to some of the women with illness and death. And um, a lot of us were saying, oh, I'm praying for you, both Christians and non-Christians were saying that. And my friend who's grown up in a Christian family doesn't now believe in Jesus said, this is turning into a religious group. What is happening? <laughs> and so I just think as life happens, it's not always good, is it? People do call out and cry out. And as a Christian, then you're there. When they want to chat, you're there for them. You don't whack it over the head, but you're there when they want to talk about it. Great. And one last question, actually, actually two questions for you. But one is, um, in all this, how, is, how do you pray for people? Like if your expectation you know, is God will do stuff, are there specific ways you kind of tend to pray for the yeah, people I mean, in your life? I'm not, I'm not very regular. And reading that passage today made me think it was whilst they were praying and fasting that God called them and sent them. I would say right now, I'm pretty desperate for a friend in a pretty desperate situation. And so regularly I think of her and I'm just like, God, please, please mm-hmm. give us a chance to talk about her before she's not with us anymore. Um, I think it helps having friends. So again, this friend that got the Kingfisher Bible texted me to say, right, let's pray for this mutual friend. So we're meeting up Tuesday night, half seven at her house for half an hour to pray. So I think if you struggle with that, just get a friend who knows your mutual friends and agree to pray together. Um, but yeah, I'd say it's mostly when the situation's desperate, I remember. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. And do we, um, before we finish, we're, like, I'm aware that you may have had on your mind, like, oh, I wanted to share this or this, and I didn't ask you a question that, that opened the door to that. Is there anything particularly that that we've missed, Nay, that you were keen to share? I just think the, the passage is so messy, right? It's just so unbelievable that it, t- it says to me that God can work in my life too. And to be expectant that, you know, there will be people that want to know the word of God in your life. Mm-hmm. And pray for that and be ready to speak as they did. 
Um, be okay with thwarting plans when things go really wrong. Be okay because God's in control. So yeah, not much more. No, that's great. <laughs> Thank you. See, I wonder if just uh, before a final song, if we just think about, for some of us, the equivalent of Nay's school playground may be the school playground, but what's the place where you mix with people who there's not like natural conversation generating How, but it's going to take something on your side to, to just initiate conversation what's that setting and who are those people what else has come to mind as you've heard Nate share this morning maybe specific people or places or situations have come to your mind this morning give you a moment just to pray um, to pray silently for them well, so Nays mentioned a couple of people the person who she the man who <coughs> she swims with and her friend who has cancer I just wondered if we might take a moment to pray for those people as well Well, Father, thank you so much for what you've spoken to us through the passage that Nay opened up with us. I thank you for the way that you are at work in her life, through her building community and connections with people. I uh, thank you also that that's not unique to her situation. That's something in which you want to use all of us in smaller or larger ways. And I pray that you would help us to have the boldness to just reach out and form relationship and connection with people this week and beyond father and i pray that you would surprise us in the way that you open up conversations within those kind of relationships and settings and we pray this in the name of jesus amen and now we'll have our final song <laughs>
Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What a great comfort it is that we can come to Jesus just as we are, and he won't pile more burdens upon us. We can come just as we are. We don't have to reach a certain age. We don't have to have passed certain exams. Thank you, Lord. We don't have to have a neat and tidy past. We don't have to have a present that's all together. We can just come as we are right now because Jesus has invited us to come. All we need to do is know him a little and he will help us to move on from there along those paths that Nate has talked about. We can come because Jesus loves every single one of us, whatever state we're in, whatever stage of life we're in. We can come because Jesus' purpose in coming to earth was to bridge the gap between us and the Father. Let's pray. Father God, loving Jesus, precious Holy Spirit, you know everything about every one of us here. You know the good, the bad, and the ugly, and yet you love us still and long to be close to us. Thank you for giving us this simple way to remember who you are and what you've done for us. Thank you for this bread and the way it reminds us that you went to the cross to die for our sake. Thank you for this wine and the way it reminds us that you bled on the cross so we can have a fresh start and be washed clean. Every day we all go wrong in some way, be it in big or small ways. And now we just pause for a few moments before you and bring our lives just as they are, our thoughts, our words and our actions before you. We ask you to help each of us now to move forward in the way you want us to. And in Jesus' name, we give ourselves to you again, whether it's for the first time or whether we've believed in you for a long time. Amen. Will Nancy and Steve come forward, please? eat the bread as we receive it. Just as Jesus told us to remember him, his body, his suffering as we eat the bread. So he tells us to drink this wine and remember his blood poured out for us. We hold the cups and drink together. And these simple symbols we have remembered Jesus' death on the cross and that his blood has washed us clean once and for all. Lord God, Help us day by day, minute by minute, to remember what you have done for us and what you have promised that you will do for us in days to come. God of grace, we thank you for inviting us to this table and to be your present day disciples. Here we have taken not ordinary bread, but the bread of heaven. Here we have drunk not wine as we know it, but the new wine of your kingdom. Fill us anew with your Holy Spirit as we go out into the world, that we may truly be a gospel people, and that as we go, we may be good news to the world around us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, our Saviour and our Redeemer. Amen. I'm going to stand and sing our final, final song. Cornerstone. Jesus.
is an essential cornings, cornerstone to our lives. He makes the weak strong as we serve him and walk with him.